Uh, welcome everyone to the second session of our day and we're going to be talking uh, in this session uh, about the theme of community-based collections. So I'm Michelle Hamilton, I'm an Associate Professor of History at Western University. I live and work in the settler city of London, Ontario, which is on the lands connected to the McKee Treaty, the London Township Treaty, and the Dishwi once been Wampum. London is part of the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Attawandaran, and the Lene Pawuk. Okay, so we will turn to the presentations. We're going to have two this session. Uh, the first one uh, is exploring museological standards and traditional conservation within cultural centers by Sil Sylvia Morin. And the second one is the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation, a celebration of art and artists on Manadu Minasing, presented by no Naomi Recolet. So I'm very pleased to welcome our first speaker, Sylvia Morin. Sylvia, I'm turning it over to you. So please go ahead and unmute and uh, start your presentation. Kwekakano, Sylvia Morin, the Dishnikas, Kitagan Zibi, Nindonjaba, Nindamta, Kitagan Zibi, Anishnabeg, Pimajwa Winagamik. Bija Shigma Mi Winini, Anishnabeki, Ega Wikad, Kami Gueyan. Hey everyone, my name is Sylvia Mori. I'm from Kitagon Zibi. I work at the Kitagon Zibi Cultural Center. Welcome to Algonquin territory here that we never gave or sold. I am the Cultural Center coordinator. I wear many hats uh, in my position. I'm the archivist, curator, administrator, events meeting planner, promotions, tour guide, cultural go between for organizations, art with artists, dancers, drummers, elders, translators, programmer and conservator. So I'm jack of all trades. So we'll move to the first slide. So this is the cultural center uh, exterior and our logo. So this is just a, a look at our community. We're two hours north of Ottawa. Our traditional hunting territory spans two hours north of here to the Ottawa area to Pembroke and Oka. Oka is Oga, which means walleye. We are established in 1853. Our first uh, chief was Agon, uh, Antoine Paganawatik, which his last name means tree struck by lightning. Next slide. I chew in this slide because I was an intern in the Aboriginal Museum internship at the Canadian Museum of History back in 2000 and 2001. And that helped me with my job today and established contacts that I needed to call on later. And this was me at the Kabishnan archeological site 2001 to 2003. That was by Limi Lake, just off the shores of Gatineau. Next slide. So this is our um, cultural center. This was the old one. There was one that was located at the band office in the 1970s. This is the one that moved in 1978 to the Casey School, around the Casey School. Um, it shared a building with the community radio station. There it built a solid foundation of acquiring a collection of artifacts, photographs, collection of stories, history of elders, transferred the Algonquin language into a dictionary, created educational language curriculum for the schools, offered cultural workshops and recorded traditional activities. What they lacked was there's no specific inventory, just the furniture inventory, no humidity control, no AC in the summer, uh, storage space was limited, Tours did cost a dollar, and I worked there for two summers in 1990. Next slide. So this is the uh, new cultural center, the field where it was built to today. There's a gas station uh, right across it. We had our grand opening December 9, 2005. That's the aerial shot of the center. If you zoom in, you could see the concrete uh, makes a turtle shape. The building was designed by Douglas Cardinal Architectural Firm, designed on the four directions, designed as a cultural educational display center. 
uh, it's built circular and, and which gives little problems with uh, how to use up the space uh, adequately because there's no corners. And it's a one level building. And there's um, my office, my second office in the picture there. My first office had no furniture for a few weeks. The second office was a, my seat was a flower pot and the, my chair was the desk for a while. And the third one, I had used the office furniture. And I started here in 2005 when the building was created. I wasn't part of like how to design the building or what would go into it. But my interview for this job actually asked like, how would you create an exhibit? So I had already prepared that beforehand. So next slide. The cultural center role in dealing with community and their artifacts. The community's perception of the cultural center's use and value is important. The continued cultural center, we continued the, their goals from the previous center, such as a old photo community calendar, which builds our photographic collection that we share with the community, cultural and language workshops and tours now cost $10. And we brought it into modern day with all the digital techniques, digitizing stuff, social media um, uh, apps and um, posting on social media, uh, Can8, YouTube uh, language uh, lesson videos, Facebook clips that have the language, uh, built into it. So that's part of the language department that's located here that's been dealing, doing that. And we're trying to bring the center up to museum standards since it wasn't technically a museum. Um, so we involve the, the community by um, getting them to come in and help create exhibits, help with writing the labels, writing the text, writing the story or getting their feedback. They may feel like they don't know what they can offer, but they have a lot to offer. We got them involved by bringing items to loan to us and tell its story. We get them to help with activities and how-to videos. Uh, they help us with translation, the fluent ones, the requests, and there's quite a bit coming in. They've also translated the cultural center um, labels too. Um, we get them to help with the, when we have meetings with organizations who want meetings with elders or community members. So we involve them to come in, uh, even the other resource people. We formed an ad hoc committee. Um, we meet once a year or when needed. And we meet with them like to help with what can we display, what can't we display. And the, uh, what we can tell, like stories we can tell and not tell. And we still, uh, we offered cultural and conservation workshops. The attendance was low at first because they're not sure what exactly goes on. But then as they heard about it, then it increased. And listen to the community. Even their criticisms, constructive criticism help. We listened, adjusted our exhibits offered a free tour to um, a man and his uh, daughter to run through the exhibit, tell us what's missing, what's possibly wrong. And so we adjusted the tour according to what they had to say. And we did that for community members too. We may not understand how to show the object sometime, but the community helps us to tell the story. We had to believe in ourselves too as workers here because we feel stressed and that we're not doing enough, not doing fast enough. But we have to remember we're doing the best we can. And all the uh, demands coming in, I guess shows us that uh, we're doing a good job. Community trust. Uh, we had to show the community that their artifact would not get lost or damaged. We wouldn't lose their object. We wouldn't give it away to anyone. Uh, they can't be loaned out to anyone without their permission. And if somebody does pass away, there's a 
next of kin on their in um, their loan form, or we go through the bank with whoever was their uh, estate manager. And their collect and load or artifact won't be kept forever. They can come and get it when they please. So that's why we have to adjust our exhibits accordingly when they come and get something. Sometimes they'll leave us another one. So it's kind of always not rotating, but adjusting. And we always ask their permission anyway, even though we have it to showcase their items, whether here or um, at other institutions. And they also come to us for scanning, faxing, printing, resume help, interviews. So we try and help them as best we could. And the paperwork incoming loans, outgoing loans. We also have a paper when we would go visit someone to see their item. We sign a paper with them that we did not take their item. And if they come here with their item, we have them sign a paper that they did not leave their item here. Just so everyone's all safe and everything's clear. Uh, next slide. Cultural conservation happens through recording, documenting oral histories, songs, events, anything going on here or in the community, and through cultural workshops, which we offer here through hands-on workshops, such as leather crafts, baskets, sewing, canoe, demonstrations, language classes and workshops, cooking, dancing, drumming, meetings and working with organizations also helps to keep our language and history out there in public uh, through their exhibition labels, plaques, or just general connection working with them. It educates people about our cultural language and history through our tours here too, that we offer to um, meeting groups that come and to tour groups and uh, the cultural workshops they want, which can be crafts, demonstrations, uh, vendors, and uh, food tasting or an actual lunch. And uh, we continue to work on what the previous center has done before. And next slide. So this is the help we got from uh, organizations, uh, local businesses within the community and the town of Manawaki, Canadian Conservation Institute, Canadian Museum of History, University of Montreal, Museum of Mastuyash, National Capital Commission, and our funding comes from um, First Nations Confederacy of Cultural Education Centers, as well as the Heritage Service Agreement through City of Ottawa. We did get some from the Museum Assistance Program too. And the facility, cultural facility fund from City of Ottawa for our humidifier. And we did have uh, traveling exhibits from the Heritage Center on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Um, from another exhibit from Mastuyash and um, Champlain's travel up the Ottawa River. Um, it's, a, it's a panel of pictures. So we have that too on display. I forgot to add it there. Next slide. So this just shows a, a rundown of uh, the center's history, the new center from a new building, new horizons comes new challenges. So it just shows a brief timeline of what, the, what we did. Uh, next slide. So conservation. For cataloging, we had no cataloging system before, just furniture inventory. So 2005, we started the our own cataloging number system, which was 073 for the band, KZ um, for the Kitagon ZB. Uh, AV for audio visual, or you add a T for text. And if it's a loan, you put an L in front of the, the whole number. We called upon CCI for help 
because we didn't know what to do when they were lights in the cases that directly hit the objects. So they showed us how to rig our exhibit away from the direct light, keep lights off when not in use, monitor our temperature and lux levels throughout the building because we have a lot of windows here, so a lot of light filters in. Uh, cases did fog up after a year, so we had to clean them, which brought a new problem where when people are cleaning them and it's not me, that they might uh, mix up the tags. So that was a challenge. And then storage. We didn't have enough storage here too, a specific area. So we went from one small room of storage to up in the rafters to back down in its own room. Yeah, numbering. 2013, we reached out the, to the University of Montreal and Museum of Mastuyash to help us with our collections. So we closed down for a month. We uh, had new accession numbers given, like 2021 20, point whatever, L in the front for loans. We realized that our collection was made up of loans. So we had a new numbering system for, uh, for our photographs we took of each object that we, uh, I guess, did the, almost like professionally. And to actually catalog that onto the computer with new sets of numbers and our archaeological database. So for us, we have about 8,000 items in our database that includes slides, negatives, films, cassettes, DVDs, um, papers, books, uh, photographs, and the collections itself. And that's like every bit like little flakes too. So during this time, we took down our collections from the rafters. We created an artifact catalog sheet that we used from Masturiash as an example. Um, we recreated our exhibits, created a five-year plan, made a manual for the center, had an area for documentation and oral history lab. We contacted the Canadian Museum of History for their facility report to bring the center up to code. Uh, then we had the, I wanted to get the collections out of my mind and in, into a database because when I'm called, I know where everything is. So we got software on FileMaker Pro with virtual collections that we still use. Uh, I have a new computer, but I don't have time to install the FileMaker Pro yet on there. And I think it might have been outdated or changed to Clarice. Supplies and equipment goes into how to store things and organizational aspect. And uh, exhibition. 2014, we reached out to the Canadian Museum of History for cabinets and cases, used ones, which was cheaper on us than good. Um, any display cases or cabinets we did receive, we repainted and they look good. They still work. Uh, University of Mastiriash and University of Montreal helped us to show us how to store things basically and organize stuff with what we have. 2016, we contacted conservation at the Museum of History, which led us how to store items, how to roll up our textiles, store clothing. They loaned us hydrotermographers, I'm not sure how to say it, data loggers, and showed me how to read it and download it, how to conserve old books with acid-free paper and cardboard, make our own boxes, use what materials we have on our own budget. And store our archeological items. And we did a lot of ironing for uh, rolling textiles. We did contact the other organizations too. And then which led us to um, exhibition with that said, we had the help of um, 
Canadian Museum of History and their Conservation and University of Mass uh, Montreal and Museum of Mass Theory Arts to help us to show, uh, to exhibit our items properly without damaging them while they're on exhibit. It was, and we showed them certain ways we can do it that they didn't know about. So it was a learning process both ways. Our strategy, uh, next slide. Our cost saving techniques. So we bought local or online. We couldn't afford big brand name uh, items. So we used what we had and what was available. We think outside the box. We use cardboard boxes to organize uh, our um, filing uh, supplies, uh, even like our collections for a while. They acted as temporary shelving. We checked with the conservation people what we can do and possibly do uh, for now. I went to the local hardware store asking them Here's what the museum uses. What do you have that I that's similar that I can use? And they always had an alternative. And it was a learning process for them too. When I went there for fishing line, I said, I need something to hang or display stuff that won't break. And they offered me clear fishing line and they kept teasing me like, what are you gonna catch? Like a 14 pound fish? And, so we use produce crates from the store that was stackable before Walmart had any. So uh, it came in handy a lot. And we bought some too. We called the local museums, art galleries to use their file cab, uh, to purchase old file cabinets, exhibit cases, or excess stock if even, just to get us organized. And for help. and. Uh, when we uh, invited them for a conservation workshop, we invited the community. Community was a little bit hesitant because what are they gonna show us or, or they're just scared. But once uh, they participated a little bit, the next time they're asking us, when are they coming again? We wanna do this and I wanna protect this, protect a basket or an old book. So, and we call them like, what equipment do we need? What can we purchase on a limited budget? So they're always there to help. And think ahead in decades. That's for lighting your cases. Like we use mobile cases from the old cultural center, the shelving, and what you want your center to become. Uh, what activities you do indoor, outdoors. Uh, because if, um, if you have um, basket making, it takes a lot of space. Uh, our shelvings are wooden for the collections where we put a mat on it. So we know we wanna fix those as we go, but uh, that'll come in time. And yeah, contact institutions, museums, galleries for anything and everything that they can help you or send you to the correct person challenge with interpreting one's own culture. I know it's not there, but uh, being repetitive. Our community was like, we already know our history. Why show it? Or why would I come here to see it? So we showed parts of history that were important to them, more in depth, but we also kept uh, in tune for the general public too. So it's geared towards both. We may not be a official museum, but we have the same value and importance as one. Uh, next slide. So there number slide one is our uh, recent photo of our supply room. That's all the language you see. That's only for community. It was once our archive room with no windows, but it was too hot for everything to stay in there and piled up and everything. So they were moved to the rafters, as you can see in number two, but that was hazardous to go up and down the long ladder to get the bins that are heavy and all that. And then they're all in bins, it's, but I labeled the bins too. Uh, three was our original workshop area, which is now our collections room, our archive room. And 
where our translator works. Uh, next slide. So all our office is double or triple in usage. So mine is like the documentation in my office. Also our media technician has the audio visual stuff. Language uh, person has uh, all the curriculum and resources and the translator has uh, our collections. So you can see the crates, uh, we use the, the food crates, our wooden shelving. Every shelf is labeled, every crate is labeled, every level is labeled, every area in the building is labeled so we know where, where our artifact is. This was uh, number six was our old uh, glass shelving where a little girl said, I can't see, my father has to pick me up. So we removed the glass shelving and we adjusted the exhibit. And so that's how we had stored, um, showed stuff before with a lot of labels. Now we took down the labels. Uh, number seven was uh, Master Yash and University of Montreal coming to help us uh, overhaul our collection. That's us learning how to I tag, label, identify. And we had community resource people that were interested to come in and help and see the process and others were working on exhibitions, how to exhibit. And that's us photographing on number eight. And next slide. So that's um, NCC, Ian Badgley, the archeologist that came in to help us uh, identify some of our archeological items, how to catalog them, giving us new catalog numbers and using File Pro Maker, its archeological section, how to do that. And actually like right on the object, uh, the numbering, which is really small. And, but we did it, we involved community too, those who wanted to come in and they did, or they just come and see our process and how long it takes. Um, number 10 is the ladder I was talking about to get up into the rafters where all our bins were located. And 11 was the file cabinets we bought at the Muse Canadian Museum of History. So we repainted them to Burgundy. We had one of our students do that and we purchased mannequins too from I think the Museum of History. And there was one time the mannequin I was painting, I left outside on the, on the tarp my summer student, uh, I freaked her out a bit because she came in in the morning and sees like, looks like body parts strewn all over a tarp and there she knew what it was. So she took the, the tarp under our arbor and uh, continued painting them. Uh, next slide. So this is our display now, which we revamped in 2016. Um, our case is only open at the back, not at the front. So it's hard to get in, to put bigger items and you're limited on how much space you can exhibit. And for that, that uh, paper is one whole roll. And it's, it's a core exercise to get in and out. 13 is our soldier exhibit uh, we created in 2016 with the help of summer students. We got those, uh, the cases were bought from the Canadian Museum of History and they were tough to clean, but uh, we managed and this is how we chose to display items. And this is the conservation uh, from the Canadian Museum of History. They were there before we really revamped everything showing us how to iron the, um, the artifacts without them, um, uh, the cloth artifacts without anything peeling. And um, there's one of the summer students uh, learning how to uh, fix uh, loose threading on a dress so we won't lose all the beads. So we greatly appreciated their help for that too, because uh, I know we were only able to work in the hallway because there was a youth business course going on in the lodge part. 
So uh, we are limited on what we can do. And we asked the conservation to come in and help us because we needed to roll our textiles. We have stuff just hanging on hangers, which we still do, but we're getting to it. But, the, but those ones that are hanging on hangers right now, we loan out to people before COVID for um, functions they had to attend. Uh, next slide. Okay, okay, this was just a tour group of uh, pictures uh, courtesy of a professor at Ottawa U, Nicholas. Uh, how we set up for groups uh, eating outside in the corridor. Uh, from tasting traditional food like sea pie and fry bread and the meeting space inside. So our issues we encountered with the center was uh, the built-in cases are great. We had 32, but they limit on what you can put inside uh, and it gets warm in there too. So we had to buy, um, I guess, LED lights and they cost a lot and add in a dimmer switch. We um, created mounts uh, with what we had. Uh, sometimes they're made of styrofoam, so we wrap foil or some other cloth around it to protect it. We didn't put the items directly on it. We used picture, uh, plastic picture frames to mount other items. We learned uh, that uh, it was hard to put a hockey stick in one of the cases. So we did drill holes into the cases to, uh, to get it in and then just put the black uh, electrical tape uh, to cover it. So not many notice it unless we point it out. And next slide. So this is just our um, our logo and then our band logo underneath with the blue and the seven fires and the logos of the funders uh, at NCCC and City of Ottawa and the language logo with the canoe. And we do have a Facebook site, Twitter site that we don't use too much yet. And we do have Algonquin language uh, learning video clips uh, on YouTube. So you can look at that and it's all there. So that's my presentation today. Uh, thank you, Sylvia. It was really wonderful hearing about um, the, the uh, collaborations between uh, your institution and, and all the other universities and museums that came to help you. So I'm sure there'll be more questions about that in uh, the question and answer session afterwards. Uh, but now let's turn to uh, our second presentation uh, by Naomi Recolat and um, Naomi, I turn it over to you. Ani bojo kino ea wapano kwe adishna cause Naomi Recolat shakanashi knows when we kwam kong don juba chichak do dem itunendam nang go mum pi. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Morning Woman and that refers to the new beginnings that are symbolized with the first light of day. My English name is Naomi Reckley. I come from the Wukumkong Unceded Territory, which is on Manitoulin Island. And I am of Crane Clan and I'm happy to be here today. I just wanna thank all of you for joining this virtual gathering. I know Mary, Abby, and the rest of the OMA team and planning committee have worked hard and have been looking forward to this event for some time now. Um, I graduated from the University of Toronto in 2018 with a master's in museum studies and a master's of information concentrating in archives and record management. And since that time, I have been employed at the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation. Now, like Sylvia, I have many hats. 
Uh, my formal job title is archivist, but after a few months, I kind of slipped in that programming coordinator and it just stuck. <laughs> um, but like in many community small museum space, you kind of wear multiple hats. So along with those titles of archivist and programming coordinator, I'm also the educator, the collections manager, the curator, the grant writer, the elder's assistant, the artist advocate, tour guide, researcher, media relations, outreach, conference, events planner, and archaeologist in training, <laughs> cook, janitor, gardener, and even for a while, I tried my hand in leadership as an interim executive director. So when people ask me what I do, I kind of fluster and I ask what day it is, because really it depends on the day. <laughs> so that's our beautiful logo that was designed by a local artist. Uh, you can go next slide. Yeah. So the Ojibwe Cultural Foundation was established in 1974 and is centrally located on Manitoulin Island in the Anishinaabe community of Chiging First Nation. The Ojibwe Cultural Foundation was created to preserve and revitalize the language, culture, arts, history, spirituality, and traditions of the Anishinaabe people of Middle Ministing and the surrounding areas. Let's go next slide. Our board is comprised of the is comprised of the chiefs of the six First Nation communities within the United Chiefs and Councils of Midomenisting. Allow me to repeat that. The chiefs are our board. In addition to that, we have two elders from each of these communities that sit on our elders advisory committee. Most of our major activities and projects pass through the elders for guidance, assurance, awareness, approval, and really it is just one of the protocols that we have. So you could imagine the pace in which we work in that we have to get approval not only from our elders, but we also get, have to get approval from the chiefs. And so that could either mean a slow process or just a very contemplative time <laughs> when we're doing our projects. And it's really interesting to have that dynamic of having our First Nations leaders on our board because for them, it's an opportunity to educate them as well on how museum spaces operate, but also how galleries and archives operate in general. <clears throat> so you can go next slide. For over 46 years, the OCF has been a repository of knowledge that houses a permanent collection of artworks of national significance an archaeological collection from sites across Northern Ontario, cultural materials and treasures from the region, invaluable records, photographs, and other archival materials. The facility that we are currently in was completed in 2000. It's an 11,000 square foot space that encompasses a museum, art gallery, a maker space or art studio, we have a healing lounge, a gift shop, language resources, library, archival collections that contain documents, photographs, video and audio recordings, a collection storage room, and most importantly, a community kitchen, because food is always important when we gather. Let me go next slide. A lot of times when we have people who work in the 
glam sector. So galleries, libraries, archives, museums. So when we have those type of people visit the OSDF, the common question I often get is in regards to the fire pit that is in the healing lodge. They, they often ask, is it real? How does that affect the collections? And how did it get approval? And my response is, yes, it's real. Does it affect the collections? Um, not so much. And how did it get approval? Well, I usually send them to our finance officer administrator, Sophie Corbier. And Sophie Corbier has been at the OCF since it's really been established. And there wouldn't be an OCF, I think, without Sophie. <clears throat> you go next slide. And what Sophie tells them about that fire pit is that often um, when we have elders gather or when we have important meetings, a lot of the meetings happen in that healing lodge around that fire. And so like food and well, food and fire, they kind of just kind of go together when it comes to our community. And you couldn't have the space that OCF is without those two things, I think. <clears throat> One of the qualities that I admire about the OCF is the sense of Anishinaabe ownership and Anishinaabe, be Anishinaabe being that primary voice throughout the facility. Let me go next slide. <clears throat> At the OCF, the Anishinaabe are not a collaborator, partner, bystander, or a subject, but they are the owners, they are the stakeholders, they have control, they determine access to information, they determine access to knowledge. They create policy, they narrate their own stories, and most importantly, they safeguard their collection. Go next slide. So the OCF is not just a museum or archive. It is a cultural center and community gathering place. It is a safe place for learning and sharing. Go next slide. It is a place for listening, observing and reflecting. But it is important to highlight that as a museum facility, we are very proud that the OCF is one of the only climatized collection rooms on Manitoulin Island, which allows for the safe storage of the art collection and numerous cultural items. Also, as an art facility, we are proud to be recognized as being the only indigenous led curatorial space in the Manitoulin, Algoma and Sudbury districts. Go next slide. <clears throat> Our exhibitions are rotated on a quarterly basis, going in time with nature and seasonal change. Go next slide. These exhibitions are the basis for a public art program, which inspired the direction for upcoming workshops, events, artist talks, and teachings. Go next slide. Through our community-based approach to our programming, we have come to recognize there is a lot of empathy and care that is required into helping people connect and strengthen the relationship with their culture. You go next slide. And ultimately the OCF is dedicated to nurturing the expression of Anishinaabe culture in all forms and ensuring they flourish now and remain strong for future generations. <clears throat> so just as a side note here, when I said what I do at the OCF depends on the day. Well, this is kind of an example. Um, on this day, we had um, 
a group of um, uh, of summer students that were just happened to be touring the OCF that day. And um, also on that day, we had a traveler drop off that porcupine and it's a roadkill. <laughs> and so that often happens with us. We have um, visitors, we have farmers drop off random things and those things need to be taken care of right away. And so an example right here is the porcupine. And so what these students are doing, they're learning how to take the quills off the porcupine. <clears throat> um, also, we, sometimes we have hunters that drop off hides. Uh, so we either have a choice to deal with it right away or to put it in a freezer. Um, another example happened in the fall. We had a farmer call us up saying that he has pig heads. He has three pig heads and he was wanting to know if OCF would take them because he had nowhere else to take them. <laughs> and um, our elder accepted and then, so the farmer dropped off those pig heads with no uh, real plan on what to do with them. <laughs> and um, she's like, well, I'm gonna take one. And so there's these two pig heads sitting in our, at, the, at our doorway. And I was like, well, I guess I'll take one. And so what we did with those pig heads, uh, we made head cheese. And um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not a fan of head cheese myself, but <laughs> a lot of the old people appreciate it. Yeah, so when things like that happen, they kind of take you away from your um, desk duties or any project planning that you had going on that day. and. Yeah, it's just really an unexpected um, good surprise, I guess. <laughs> and it definitely makes the job or the working um, environment here. <clears throat> um, okay, next slide. <laughs> so as you can see through the variety of images, the OCF is an extension of home, community, and nationhood. And I think it is the community influences, such as humor, language, and food, that creates a special, relaxed space for sharing, acceptance, celebration, healing, and understanding. You go next slide. <clears throat> The OCF was created as a response to concerns of cultural survival and language revitalization and language retention. But also it was the Anishinaabe artists and craftspeople that advocated for a space. And they, along with the elders, maintain an immense influence on the direction of the OCF. Yeah, next slide. So the work that is being done at cultural centers like the OCA or the Woodland Cultural Center and the many indigenous centers across Canada is a response to the movements that occurred in the 80s and 90s that were demanding for fair treatment, that were demanding for relationships to be repaired, that were demanding for reconciliation before it was trending. And most importantly, it was the dire need to be freed from the implications of colonialism. So you go to the next slide. <clears throat> the OCF has developed a, repu has developed a repu reputation as a grandmother organization that can be relied upon to provide quality programming on traditional ways of life 
contemporary art, language, and traditional crafts. <clears throat> the OCF is regularly, regularly consulted for support and guidance by local and national organizations, such as the Nishna Bamoyan Gamik Elders Home, the Kenj Gawin Tech Educational Institute, the Tom Thompson Memorial Art Gallery, the Art Gallery of Ontario, and the National Gallery of Canada. Go next slide. And so these partnerships are important, especially when it comes to assisting us with moving some of our work forward and keeping up with the standards and practices. You go next slide. <clears throat> Um, so when it comes to partnerships, OCF is the founding partner, is one of the founding partners for GRASAC. And GRASAC, for those who are familiar, is the Great Lakes Research Alliance for the Study of Aboriginal Arts and Culture. On top of that, we have an ongoing partnership with the Ontario Archaeological Society. <clears throat> And just recently, we became uh, partners on a project with the Gardner Museum. And so these two part, these two uh, partnerships with the Gardner Museum and the Ontario Archaeological Society has led us to do some interesting things with our archaeological collection and also with our Anishinaabe ceramic artists. Um, and I've talked about this at the OAS symposium back in November. And um, for me, when I spoke about it, it was very an emotional talk <clears throat> because it had to do with the revival of um, working with clay and working with land, but also um, bringing forth that knowledge of um, Anishinaabe potters, um, not just in our communities, but to the world, right? When you think of ceramic, when you think of potters, indigenous potters, automatically a lot of people think of the Southwest or they think of the Haudenosaunee. Um, but through my work here at the OCF and with these new projects, <clears throat> um, we're trying to bring the Anishinaabe perspective, the Anishinaabe knowledge, and for it to become a part of those discussions. <clears throat> Um, another one of our partnerships that we are very proud of is with York University. You go next slide. And with York University, uh, together we established the Manitoulin Island Summer Historical Institute. And it is an annual summer program that is in partnership between the OCF and the History of Indigenous Peoples Network at York University. And so Mishi is an annual summer event in Anishinaabe studies that brings together students, academics, researchers, knowledge holders, artists, and elders for a week-long educational program on Manitoulin Island. You go next slide. <clears throat> Each program has specific themes such as education, environment, gender, material culture, art, totems, or clans, among many others. And the beautiful part of the project is that Manitoulin Island um, based Anishinaabe history is being taught from the Anishinaabe perspective. So you go next slide, sir. Oh. Well, 
I didn't time this very well. <laughs> but anyways, these are some of our uh, photos of our gallery space and our artists. So you go next slide. <clears throat> Go next slide. <laughs> and you go next slide. And so when it comes to our workshops, our every space of the OCF is essentially utilized. They in these photos. Um, these are of our outside, oh, our outdoor space. <clears throat> um, these are photos of our outdoor amphitheater. And yeah, it's just using basically what we, the space that we have, right? Give me the next slide. <clears throat> Me go on the next slide. And this is our community workshop kitchen. Participants in this one are making blood sausage or nuggish. Other people call it nuggish. Me on next slide. <clears throat> and this workshop, they are um, doing how many corn? Uh, so making corn for corn soup, but also preparing it for corn flour as well. You go next slide. <clears throat> and next slide. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really done with my my notes I had prepared. So just trying to get through these slides now, but they really highlight. Um, the space that is OCF. And so to end my presentation, I just like to share this video. Um, for listening and allowing me the time to share.
the wonderful place that is the OCF. Naomi Butch. Thank you, Naomi. Um, we're already getting some uh, questions being asked. Uh, so if you do have questions, I'll remind you just to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, I will ask as many as I can. We have uh, almost 15 minutes to um, have a question and answer session. So our, my first question uh, that I received is, do you still have to freeze natural materials or supplies uh, for workshops? Uh, uh, I'm assuming that that's directed at either of either of the speakers. Um, yeah, uh, so when it comes to, like I said, with the hides, um, often if we don't have the time to work with it right away, we would put it in our freezer that we have. Oh, sorry. But the thing is right now, our freezer is full. <laughs> And so even when it comes to the materials and preserving those materials for later on in the year or later on in the season, um, we're running out of space. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yeah, I don't know, like any small museum or like any museum in general, right? Space is always an issue. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, here's a, another question for either of you. Um, are there, do you have any partnerships with area museums for Indigenous youth internships or paid support staff position or summer jobs? Um, not that I'm aware of, but the uh, not for the youth, but we have like linkages with other uh, smaller museums, like in the Aylmer. Um, we're starting a linkage in uh, Goldburn, Ontario. Naomi, what about your uh, institution? Do you have any opportunity? Yeah, uh, usually we do hire uh, local summer students. Uh, so students from many of the six First Nation communities are able to um, um, come on board. And uh, we usually do that through our the local band funding. Um, with our partnership with the Ontario Archaeological Society back in, sorry, back in 2000, sorry, COVID. <laughs> COVID, the COVID year break got me mixed up with my years. Um, with the OAS in 2018, we had a um, two week uh, training uh, opportunity and that was to be the archaeological uh, monitor training. And so with that, we funded, we were able to provide funding for 14 students, 14 community members to be a part of that training. And that was done here at the OCF. And yeah, that was, that was such a successful uh, program that this coming summer, they want to do it again. And so we'll be providing that opportunity again to another round of um, community members. <clears throat> um, what else is there? Students, grad students, PhD students, we definitely welcome them. Um, in 2000, at the 2017 gathering um, for this symposium, Anang talked about the archeological collection. And so now we're finally gonna be going through that collection through those boxes with the help of a PhD student. And we're gonna start cataloging them and start cataloging what is actually all in those boxes 
And it's exciting because um, a lot of our community members still doesn't, still don't know that collection is here. And part of it is because we at the OCF aren't really sure what's in that collection as well. Like sure, we have received reports from the ministry, but but I personally personally haven't had time to go through all the reports just because of my all the other duties that I have here. And so, if with this PhD student that's coming on board this summer. And for her to go through those boxes and for her to start doing that cataloging work, it's going to be, I, it's going to be exciting and I'm looking forward to it. And I know it's going to be good for the OCF, it's going to be good for the communities. <clears throat> because um, that archaeological collection is going to be growing um, mm -hmm. as we have had um, a few interests of people wanting to rep repatriate, to return some items back to the region. And so we're looking forward to that growth, I guess. Wonderful. Can I add on that? Uh, Absolutely. We have um, some summer students every year, except with the COVID uh, times. Um, one every year for the cultural center and the person works on the I've made them work on the database they keep plugging in the numbers so that was their main job and also answering phones uh, if they had access to a phone because we usually just stuck them here and there in the center um, and we had a usually another student for the language program so everybody shared their duties so the, the language student was also helping with tours and uh, setting up for meetings and uh, visits and activities outside. So, and uh, the University of Montreal used their interns in whatever program to help, um, I guess, get credits to come and help the center here with the, when we overhauled our collections. Okay, we have another question about um, the amount of uh, square feet you have for exhibit and storage space uh, at your institutions. I'm not sure if those uh, numbers are, are something that you have in at the top of your uh, top of your mind or not. I don't have numbers per se, but the if I had more time, I would have showed you how the room looked. <laughs> but uh, yeah, our storage is very small. Oh, not very small, but it's limited because now it shares an office with the, the, uh, the translator. Plus our materials that we use for workshops, we store them in a separate little area. So we kind of divided the, the space. Okay. Uh, our next question is, how could local uh, civic or provincial museums best support your work? Uh, in what ways can they foster authentic and beneficial relationships? I guess uh, help us uh, when, when we make a call out and we'll also in turn try and help you with uh, whatever, um, if you need translations or help with texts, like reviewing texts uh, related to the Algonquin nation here. And I guess tell us, uh, for me, it was more when I contacted the institution asking if they had some kind of report, if we wanted loans from them, what do we need to do? So they're like, here you go, here's the facility report and here's what you have to do, the steps to get your center going. And uh, um, I do look on their website for uh, whatever funding they have available um, for projects and all that, so. Naomi, do you have anything to add? 
Um, I think it's just this more assistance, um, support when it comes to professional standards and professional practices. I definitely think um, the OCF does need support when it comes to those areas. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, we, right now our focus has always been about art, culture, and language. And those museum standards or those archival standards kind of fall to the side. And so we need help, we need assistance, or we need advocacy when it comes to training our own people and providing um, opportunities when it comes to um, those areas. Like I really liked these, the archeological monitor training that was provided because that training was done here at the OCF, but it was training of Western, it was like a well-balanced training of Western practices and Anishinaabe practices. And it was um, awesome. It was great to see the students, especially the younger ones um, that were either in first year university programs when they completed that two week training, they were convinced um, in changing their program to archeology. span <clears throat> um, So I think it's like more opportunities like that would be um, great and helpful to our communities and to our community members. Okay, I'll follow up with just one more question and then we're out of time. It kind of follows on, on the question before, but uh, the question is, is Mishi expanding to tr additional partnerships and working with other institutions, including York University? Uh, yeah, so Mishi, um, York University was the um, applicant for the funding but that program is not just for York University, um, the community of York University. It, it's open to anybody to apply to. Um, and so we had um, academics and researchers from all across Canada and into the US. Um, the last year of Michi in 2018, like in that video, we had um, delegates from New Mexico that were, that came up. Um, we have one from New Brunswick. Yeah, so it's all over. It, that program is open to anybody to apply to. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, so I wanna thank both of you, Naomi and Sylvia, some very interesting presentations. It's, it's wonderful to see how uh, cultural centers are, uh, they have a much broader mandate than it is to just collect and, and exhibit artifacts that, um, uh, that you're serving your community in various ways. And the, the one, uh, I guess, thought I'll, I'll leave everybody with um, before we break is, is something um, that, uh, that was mentioned in the presentations is that um, a, a cultural center uh, can be an extension of a home in a community. And I, I thought that was a lovely sentiment, a very powerful sentiment um, uh, to think about. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>